Reading from Matthew 14, verses 22 through 33. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. After he had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land for the wind was against them. And early in the morning he came walking towards them on the lake. But when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified, saying, It's a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen. So I have never really been the type of person to take any sort of risk or put too much faith into anything. No matter how hard I try, there's always this little voice in the back of my head that's like, well, yeah, but what if you're wrong? And this usually puts me in an awkward situation because, I mean, it's said that without risk, there's no reward. And I like being rewarded. So. When I read this passage and the only convincing that Peter needed to risk his life and go out on the water was, hey, it's me, Jesus, come on over. I was like, um, I don't, I don't know. It felt, I imagine how liberating it must feel to be able to put so much faith into something only to have it come true. But it also makes me think of times where, I don't know, I've actually done that and I've had that reward in my own life. Sure, I'll probably never be out in a boat and encounter the literal Son of God and walk on water, but there are so many times in our life that we are called upon to put our faith into something, to believe that something will be as good as we hope, and then, well, just hope. I know that in my life I've tried to do the very same thing. When I was going into my freshman year, I had to do a one-on-one audition for band. It went okay, and at the end of it, the band director, Mr. Walsh, who I was deathly afraid of despite having just met him, asked me a simple question. Do you want to join the marching band? And at the time, I only knew three things about marching band at West. One, it would require a decent amount of physical effort, something I had never been too fond of. (laughs) Two, I would have to practice to make sure I knew the music. Practicing had never been and still isn't something I do too often. And three, the band got to go on cool spring break vacations like Hawaii and places in Europe. For those reasons, and because I found it hard to say no to the intimidating bald man uh, across from me, I agreed. And although for the first year that I did marching band, I kept swearing to myself that this was it, I'm done. I still stuck with it because I had heard throughout the year from all of the seniors and upperclassmen about how much of a transformative experience it had been for people. And I'm really glad that I did put that faith into it because three years later I've met some of my best friends, I got to go on the fun trip, and I actually became the band president, which admittedly is a role that so far has required no responsibility or actual prestige. (laughs) But hey, it sounds kind of cool, I guess. If I had said no three years ago, I don't think I would be anywhere close to who I am today. 
I was an awkward freshman who had little to no social skills, and now I'm an awkward, almost senior with decent social skills and a community around me that I care about while knowing that they care about me. And I do wonder if that's how the disciples felt. They had dropped everything to follow this guy who simply was being claimed to be the son of God and listened to him teach and spread his word. I feel like nowadays, if someone came up to me and tried to get me to drop everything and spread his teachings, I would be more than a little apprehensive about the situation. But they did that. They left their jobs and journeyed with Jesus and had that feeling. You truly are the son of God. And I think it's every kid's fantasy to go on an adventure like that. When I was a kid, part of me always dreamed that when I grew up, I would set off on a journey and, I don't know, do great things while still eating junk food for dinner and staying up past my bedtime. I was obsessed with Star Wars and Indiana Jones and had so much fun running around in my friend's backyard pretending we were in spaceships or looking around random places in my house that obviously would contain more treasure than I would know what to do with. Even today, I still long for those days where I would have just given anything to go on that adventure, to just put my faith on the line and to set out and see new and exotic lands, to be able to leave it all behind. Yet I still find myself realizing that I can't do that. And to an extent, I sort of don't want to. I can't give up everything that I've known, my family, my friends, my education, in order to go on these adventures and spread this good that I've always wanted to. So while I don't ever think that I'll be cut out for discipleship and I'll never have to risk my life out in the storm to follow the proclaimed Son of God, I know that there are some things that I can still put my faith in and that I have. I've put my faith in my friends to be there when I need them most. I've put my faith in my family to offer advice and words of wisdom when I myself can't find the words. I can put faith in this community who I can trust to welcome me with open arms and when I have trouble seeing my own faith and finding my journey, they can show me the way. And I can learn to put faith in more and more things knowing that if my faith is misplaced, I will not be alone, and when my faith and trust is placed properly, I will be able to become a stronger person because of it, to slowly but surely become my best self. Amen. In seventh grade, I asked my parents if I could get a cell phone. In response, I was given a small green book that looked worn from use titled, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. I was told that I could get a phone once I had finished reading the book and discussing it with them. When they first told me my task, I was a little confused at the message they were trying to send me by having me read a book about winning friends. But I went along with it because I really, really wanted a cell phone. <laughs> the book had an entire chapter dedicated to learning the names and faces of people who you meet. It emphasized the power of using a person's name when you were talking to them because it made them feel like they were more important. The sentiment made sense to me. People enjoyed feeling recognized. As I've gone on in my schooling, won more friends and influenced more people, I've tried the technique mentioned in the book, connecting a face to a name as quickly as possible. But what if that's impossible? What if we can't recognize the face of someone staring right back at us? Prosopagnosia, as it's called, is a neurological disorder characterized by the inability to recognize faces, and it's also known as face blindness. Individuals who have this disorder physically can't recognize someone. And a 2006 study suggests that 2% of the general population may struggle with face blindness. There is no treatment for prosopagnosia. There are only strategies individuals with the disorder can use to help them recognize others. Sometimes it seems like all of us have prosopagnosia. 
it's really difficult to recognize something even if it's right in front of us. In the passage, the disciples had a hard time recognizing that it was Jesus in their midst. Originally, when they saw Jesus walking on the water, their first instinct was that it was a ghost. They witnessed the divine, something they had been observant to so many times before, yet they failed to recognize that it was their friend and their mentor, and instead turned to a supernatural explanation. It's not only the disciples that can be ensnared by the inability to recognize God and the divine in their midst. How easy is it for you to see the divine when you're buried under piles of paperwork or endless sheets of homework? Yet God's presence is clear to us in the beauty of a sunset or the laugh of a child. God's love is with us always, embracing us at all times, not only in the pink glow of dusk, but also in the late nights when our hands ache from writing too much and our head buzzes from the last cup of coffee. It wasn't on a nice sunny day with calm waters when the disciples had a difficult time recognizing Jesus. It was dark and windy and the disciples were exhausted in a boat that had been battered by the waves. In the thick of things, when the darkness and the wind and the exhaustion set in, this is when the disciples fail to see Jesus for who he really is. For us too, in the monotony of worksheets and the exhaustion and stress of hard days, it's difficult to find anything divine approaching. Sometimes, just like the disciples, we fail to recognize that there are miracles that are happening around us when we're caught up in our own fear and worry and anxiety. Despite the difficulty there is to spot it, God's presence is steadfastly by our side at all times, but it takes some faith and it takes some trust in order to witness it. Peter took that leap of faith. Even when he was unaware that it was Jesus walking towards him, Peter stepped out into the water because he was commanded to. That took courage and that took a lot of faith. But then he stumbled. He remembered that he didn't know for sure that it was Jesus and he felt the choppy waters and strong winds battering him and he began to fall just to have Jesus reach out and catch him save him from crashing into the dark, murky waters. In fact, Peter's shaky escapade is a lot like my own faith. I've spent countless Sunday mornings, youth group meetings, work camps, discussions with friends, taking one unsteady step after another, trying to reach something that I have a hard time recognizing is even there. I've fumbled time after time, wondering where God is in the hardships my friends have faced, in the deaths of family members, in the bad test grade, and in the friendship troubles. I've cried tears of sadness and frustration, felt shaky building my house on a rock that I can never be certain is truly there. I have felt like the disciples and Peter too many times to count. Sometimes we all have certain degrees of prosopagnosia. There are strategies we can use to help us recognize things more easily, but we'll never truly know for sure what we're looking at. We can take uncertain steps in what we think is the right direction. We can take that leap of faith, but that doesn't mean that we'll never stumble. That doesn't mean that we'll always be able to recognize God on the other side of our struggle. It's okay to doubt. It's natural to find it difficult to see God in the mundane or in the frightening. But just as Jesus studied Peter during his trial, God is there guiding us through the thick and through the thin, holding us up through the uncertain waters. The face of God embodies each one of us, the smiles of pure joy to the grimaces of pain to the tear-stained cheeks. A face like that can be hard to recognize, even to those who see it more frequently. The disciples were Jesus' closest friends, but even they failed to truly see him for who he was. It's difficult to recognize God's face, God's presence in our own lives, in our own trials, and in our own hardships. But he's there, catching us when we fall, building us up through our faith and through our friends. And there's nothing to doubt about that. Amen.